Hello again, we're graphing square root function, square root uh, excuse me, equation. So in the last lesson, we learned where a graph starts uh, on the x-axis, uh, whether it's shifted to the left or whether it's shifted to the right by simply taking the opposite value inside the square root and dividing by the number in front of x. When we have a number outside the square root of x, on the right side of the equation where we're adding or subtracting, it doesn't shift uh, horizontally, it shifts the graph vertically. And this one's going to shift the graph 1 up, and this one's going to shift the graph 1 down. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I already made my tables. Now, uh, some of you might be asking, well, why did you use the same values for x as I thought that changes things? Yeah, it does when uh, I've got something inside the square root. But when I've just got x, the values, the typical values that I use are the same. 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. If you wanted to make a five table chart. Now, you can't use negatives because that's outside its domain. You can't plug in, excuse me, you can't substitute in a negative number inside for a square root of x. Uh, we haven't, well, we did do a little bit of exposure to uh, imaginary numbers, but not enough to go ahead and do anything that sophisticated. So with that said, let me go ahead and graph this first one. As, I, as you can see, I already got all the values ready. I'm very excited about that. Again, there's your typical square root function going up. Eh, not as fast as you would want it to, but not that bad either. Ooh. Just occurred to me that I needed another number. When I substitute in 0 into this one, I get the square root of 0, which is 0 plus 1. So this one actually starts at 1. This is the square root of 1, which is 1, plus 1 is 2. Square root of 4, which is 2, plus 1 is 3. Square root of 9, which is 3, plus 1, which is 4. Square root of 16, which is 4, plus 1, which is 5. And when I do that, well, I'm not going to take that much, but I know that each value is shifted up one spot. If this were a 2, each value would be shifted up 2. If it were a 3, it would be shifted up 3. Same type of model, except it started right there. And then the last one. Do you think I actually have to compute this? Do you have to compute this? I mean, it's negative 1. Look at this one. So all you really have to do is look at these values and just go one down from its parent function. That's it. Mm. Not the most perfect graph, but it represents what I need to do for the most part. So that's what happens. How does that affect domain and range? Let me go ahead and write uh, domain and range very quickly. Please join us in the youth service department with the Kwanis for a fun story hour with Kwanis and Starting now at 11 o'clock. Thank you. I guess they're even sick of hearing the same domain over and over again. That was my attempt at humor. Uh, so it goes from zero to infinity. You can't plug in any negative numbers for x into here. The range is a little bit different. For the first one, it goes from 0 to infinity. But from this one, the black graph, it starts at 1 and goes up. Oops. That actually includes the number of negative 1, so it has to be a square, not a circular graph goes to infinity. So that's a brief introduction into graphing square root functions. Uh, it depends. If I have a number after the square root, it shifts it up. If I have a number inside here, I've got to take the opposite, divided by the number in front of x. And you could have a number in front of the x, something inside the square root with x, and this all at the same time. And you don't really have to sit there and graph it. All you really have to know is what the parent function looks like and adjust it accordingly. And if I saw a function like that, uh, let's say y equals 2 square root x minus 2 plus 4, I could say, oh, okay, it's right here and right here, so it starts there and it goes up fast. 
It's as simple as that. I mean, you don't really need to know what's going on. I mean, well, no, that's probably a poor way to phrase it. You need to know what's going on, but you don't need to sit there and make tables all the time. And what happens is I think students get a little too reliant on the graphing calculator, and they forget that you could actually solve this probably a lot faster and understand it a lot better without a graphing calculator. So watch out. Don't be uh, too reliant on it. Try to figure out what's going on here. But I'm done for now with that tangent. And we're going to get to uh, solving radicals in general. But for right now, have a great day. Goodbye.